So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us for the uh, Partners in Education Research seminar this week. Uh, we're lucky to have Jonah Rockoff um, from the Columbia Business School. Jonah has been um, uh, doing research with the New York City Department of Education since at least 2005, um, uh, where, um, in, in fact, he was part of a team of, of three people that did an important study of the effects of teachers on long-term outcomes like earnings. Um, but uh, today, he's going to be talking to us about a paper he's written on just what are the effects of retention policies and how do you measure the effects of retention um, policies. So we're lucky to have um, uh, um, Jonah with us. And usually we run until 6.15 or like it's roughly an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll break. There'll be a reception and then... Uh, for the students who are part of the peer seminar, we'll reconvene at 6, 6.45. Okay. okay. Thanks. So what Tom forgot to mention, though, was that uh, the only reason I got to work in New York City at all was because of him. Uh, <laughs> because as in 2005, the woman who ran the alternative certification program, Vicki Bernstein, uh, wanted to do a study of the alternatively certified teachers in New York, and she knew Tom from graduate yeah, school or right. something. And Michelle Reed too. Yeah, and Tom was in was at UCLA at the time. He said, "Well, I'm interested, but I'm in LA. And Doug's in, uh, in in New Hampshire. So, so, but I know Jonah, and he's going to be at Columbia, so he can be a co-author with us. And that's how the whole thing got started. So, I, you know, do credit goes to you for getting me my foot in the door. Okay, so this is not about teachers." which is a lot my, what a lot of my research is on. This is about uh, grade retention. So let me jump uh, right in. It's, it's joint work with a student in the uh, economics department at Columbia, Tom, Tom Gang. Um, so uh, around the world, we basically use grade levels to group kids. Uh, you know, you got to group students into classrooms, or at least generally we accept the idea that in school, kids sit in a room together and they learn. That seems probably more efficient than having everyone have their own room and their own teacher. So we group them together, and how are we going to do that? That's a big question. Well, we generally do it based on these uh, grade levels, deciding where, kid, you know, who should sit uh, with whom. And, and we decide that based on their date of birth. Okay, what grade should you be in? Well, you were born here. This is when you should start school. You start school in kindergarten, and then you move up one grade level per year. So essentially, we track students by their cohort, by their birth cohort. We've decided that that's kind of the way we want to do it, to track people by their birth cohort. Okay. But not everybody is a great match for their birth cohort. We may have situations where we have kids who are just far behind or perhaps far ahead of the rest of their birth cohort. And so naturally, we have to address this question of what do we do when we have outliers, right? We group kids, I believe, not just because we think the people who are similarly aged should be together, but because we want to group kids together who have similar levels of skills, and preparation because we're teaching a certain set of material, okay? And so when we have kids who are outliers, the question is, do they still belong with this group or should we move them uh, somewhere else, okay? And most, I say most, but many uh, school systems across the world, and particularly in the U.S., this is a, a very common thing, is to actually retain a student, have them repeat a grade with the following cohort, with the younger cohort, if under some academic criteria, they seem to be a forfeit, if they seem to be underperforming. Now, we could also promote kids more quickly. I was talking with Dave Demi earlier today, and he was commenting that that actually was a much more common practice decades and decades ago, but we don't hear that much about, you know, you don't, you don't move, have a very bright third grader skip to fifth grade very often, um, whereas grade retention seems to be much more uh, common practice, okay? Uh, estimated you know, because they're 2% a year, but I'll give you some local data. I just pulled this off of, um, you know, Massachusetts State Department of Education website uh, yesterday. So, you know, even if you look locally, what's interesting is you see this practice, but you also see sort of heterogeneity in the practice. So I'm just going to show you uh, Boston, Brookline, and Cambridge, and this is grade retention data by grade, okay? And you can see, you know, Boston rates of retention by grade are much higher than in Brookline and uh, Cambridge, uh, on the low end, but but not quite as low as Brookline. And what you also see is, um, you know, uh, 
obviously there could be differences in population. So maybe in Boston you have lower achieving kids on average. You might have more problems with kids not achieving at grade level. But maybe you also have policy differences. Okay? Another thing to know from this um, uh, uh, sampling of local data, this is data, it's not, it's, this, is, this is more than anecdote, right? This is three school districts. <laughs> uh, you know, no school districts are avoiding retention even child. So even in Brookline, where people tend to think, oh, the schools are wonderful and everything's wonderful, okay? Even in Brookline, you do see a little bit of, of grade retention. It's, it's not that there's school districts who have signed off, of, you know, have completely signed away from, from this. But you also see that it's more, uh, uh, it's, it's more often used in the very early grades, that is, at sort of kindergarten and first grade, we try to make these adjustments. Or you also see a lot of it happening in high school when kids are sort of failing courses and then having to repeat a grade. Less so in, in, in the middle of this. Okay? Now, is this a good policy? Is, is forcing kids to repeat a grade, is this, could this be a, a good thing? Um, we can see, theoretically, it's going to have potentially positive or negative impacts. Let me just run down sort of a list of what I think the possible impacts are. There's probably more, but let me just run down uh, a list here. On the positive side, you know, students' knowledge or their preparation uh, is going to be better aligned with the class material and the peers in, in, in the classroom. So everyone's time use is going to be more productive, both the retained students who are now being taught stuff that's more directed at their level of knowledge and preparation skills, but also the time use of everybody else could, is going to be better because, for example, you know, I don't have to deal with you know, Jonah is, is lagging behind, and the teacher requires is required to spend a lot of time with me because I'm having per struggling in the classroom. Everyone's time used to be more productive if, 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 if what's uh, going on is more aligned with where people are. Okay? Uh, also, you're going to flag a bunch of students as struggling. Right? The fact that I was retained is pretty clear to the teacher, and they know, hey, this is a struggling student. They need additional attention. They need additional resources. That maybe also have a, a positive effect. There could also be sort of these broader... Uh, kind of general equilibrium type effects here, which is, you know, if it's possible to be retained and kids don't like failing and having to repeat the grade, okay, just like you might not have time to repeat a class that you studied for already, okay, that could give broader incentives for people to invest in education. I'm not going to talk about this. is not something that I'm going to be too much about in, in this paper, but there's, a, there's one study I've seen in Brazil that suggests this type of effect exists, and so we should put it out there. But on the negative side, we have a strong argument from a lot of research about stigmatization. Okay? You label somebody as failing, you make them repeat a grade, you're putting this stigma uh, on a student, you're labeling them in this negative way, and that's going to lead to these, these, these students who have now been you know, stamped on their forehead, you are a failure, to lead them to underinvest in education. Right? Because I, you, you told me I'm bad at this, why should I bother studying and working hard? Okay? And the other thing, which is kind of obvious, and I'm not going to touch on really the cost, but it's very clear, I'm paying to educate you again on the same material. Okay, so as an economist, you know, we, we always want to put out something, we want to always, you know, pay heed to the cost side, even if we can't measure directly how, you know, how much we'd be willing to, how much of the, should we, uh, sorry, miss the, if retention is bad, we have to, it's also bad on the cost side. Okay? It better be that retention has some positive impacts if we're willing to pay any money for it. And clearly it's costing us something. Right? If we have to basically pay 2% uh, for 2% of the population you have to uh, educate them twice, that's going to add up. Okay. Yeah, Tom. Jonah, one thing, actually, the way you just laid it out made me wonder, okay, so if this ability grouping is the, if, you know, ability grouping is the reason for the why don't we more frequently see the accelerated, you know, promotion? Because actually, if anything, it's associated with cost savings. It would be associated with a positive, you know, you're not delivering bad news yeah. to a kid, you're, you're delivering good news to them. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't know an answer. I'll give you Dave's answer. Uh, from earlier today in my discussion with him, and I can't because he's not here, so I can say whatever I want about what he said. Uh, you know, he was saying that he thinks that, look, parents uh, care a lot about their kids' relative performance, and it's not clear that a parent would say, would want their outstanding third grader to be a struggling fifth grader. Um, you know, I don't know how much that's true, but I do know, look, it's not even discussed as an option, right? Like, most parents in public schools understand that if your kid struggles, they could repeat a grade. 
I don't know of anyone who's even been offered the, the possibility of saying, hey, you know what, you know, your kid's really, really bright. Why don't you send them, you know, your third grader should be in fifth grade. It's just, I don't even think it's on the table. Why? Great question. You're right. It's a cost saver. It's a cost saver, and it could improve, you know. But I also think that many parents probably are not in a rush for their kids to grow up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 like, so here's a personal story that provides an alternative explanation. Yeah. So, um, my wife and I, when our child was uh, leaving fifth grade and going to a private school, we had to decide whether to retain him and have him redo fifth grade or have him go up to sixth grade. And we were hemming and hawing and wondering, you know, is this going to be good for him or not? And, and and then my wife, it occurred to her, wait a minute, so this means we get to have him with us for another year? <laughs> Bang! Like, she made <laughs> just I that, you know, that children have put turned into just this normal good. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, not, not an in, they're, not, they're not a productive investment anymore. They're a normal good. He gets one less of, <laughs> one less of your earnings over time. Yeah, but we, like, that didn't <laughs> enter yeah. into our... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say you want to answer this. In, sorry, please. Jonah, the, the literature in education makes the point that retention is good in early grades and it's bad in later grades. And, and, and your, your separation doesn't separate about early grades. Yes. And, and it, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm just saying good or bad, positive or negative, you're right. It could be that the positive aspects outweigh the negative in early grades and in the later grades. Yes. The, the balance swings, swings, swings the other way. And clearly, as, as you've seen from the data, and you could see the same thing in New York, people are much more comfortable with repetition, at least in the earlier grades than in the middle grades. And the, the thing is, I'm going to focus on a policy today that actually does retention right where you see at least between grades 3 and 8, okay. um, which is, I think, instructive, given the, 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 what we see going on in earlier grades. Um, and I also think, you know, I think, I think also... Um, the problem is a lot of the literature that follows this type of strategy that I'm going to talk about, a regression discontinuity strategy focusing on places where they have standardized tests, they're not doing kindergarten, right? Because even if although a lot of the retention is happening in kindergarten, they have no plausible instrument for why some kids get retained and some don't, okay? And so that, you know, I think a difficulty and a shortcoming of what we're doing here is that, you know, we're looking for the keys under the, under the lamplight not necessarily in the place where we really ought to be most interested in the impacts of retention, which might be a kindergarten problem. Okay, uh, okay so two, two major difficulties. The first is the establishing the counterfactual. Sort of in all causal inference, we want to know what's the valid counterfactual. If this child did not repeat a grade, what would have happened to them? Okay, and the solution to this has generally been the regression discontinuity. So you have a test score, a continuous test score, and if you fail based on some cutoff, then you're put at risk for, for, for being retained. You have this discontinuous jump in the, in the threat of the risk of being retained, and then we're going to do that. Okay, so now we think we have a valid comparison between students who just pass the test and students who just fail. Okay, because, so, you know, we, we sort of think of it as a coin flip on the, on, on the edge of, of, of calendar. But that's only one of the major difficulties, okay? So this is well known. What I want to, what I think the contribution of our paper is, is thinking about this sec, the, sec, the second hurdle, okay? Which is, if you want to compare a student who's been retained to a student who's been promoted in any academic measure in the short run, okay, you are on thin ice. Because these students are no longer educated together. These are new students are no longer studying the same things. So coming up with a measure of academic knowledge that is somehow free of bias due to the curriculum they're being, that they're studying is just, it's in many ways, a non-starter, okay? So there's a lot of evidence, and I'll show you some from New York, that you're going to find short-run increases in test scores when you look at a retained student relative to their new cohort of younger classmates repeating the same material again. That is, my relative position in the fourth grade distribution, the second time I do fourth grade, goes way up. Okay, last year I was the worst fourth grader. Now I'm a, not such a great fourth grader, but I'm certainly not the worst. Okay, I improve a lot. But how do I compare in knowledge to the fifth graders? How would I even go about doing that? It is unclear to me. You could have, you know, you give us all the same test, but is it the fourth grade test? Or is it the fifth grade test? Okay, 
you cannot come up with a measure I think, that's fully satisfying on this. You can have vertical equation. You can try, I mean, this is where Marty's test, Marty's paper jumps off as trying to use vertical, vertical equating of tests across grades, but it relies on some serious psychometric assumptions. So I think we're, we're you know, it would be great to have measures that don't have this, uh, this, this problem. But I, it's very hard to think of measures of academic knowledge that are just completely free of whatever, our, whatever we're studying. Okay, so. We're going to use uh, an RG to, to, to look at uh, retention in, in, in uh, New York City, but the main contribution is we're going to look at outcomes on surveys that ask the same questions of parents and students regardless of what grade they're in. Okay, that's the real thing. I have a measure that I think gets answered the same, same way, that, that you know, I can compare between parents of fifth graders and parents of fourth graders who are doing fourth grade for the second time. Okay, questions like, overall, how satisfied are you with the quality of the education your child received this year? Okay. That, I think, is fairly comparable across these two sets of parents. And because the kids of these two parents are only different in their retention because one failed by a point and one passed by a point, I think we now have a valid counterfactual to think about whether retention, how retention impacted, let's say, parental responses on this. Okay? We're going to follow students for up to three years after retention. We just literally got the data like two weeks ago or three weeks ago where I can follow the kids for a longer period of time. I don't know the results to show you today, but the, the, it, it's, I had my research assistant send me the results like two days ago, and the parent results hold up in years four to six. Okay? I can tell you that. I can't show you the graph. Um, and what else? Oh, so um, we also find that students uh, who retain due to failing the high stakes, they report feeling safer in school, but the main result is that parents report feeling greater satisfaction with their child's education. And I should say, when I presented this before, people said, wait, wait, but you know, you're, uh, maybe I'm not being uh, strong enough about these results. I'm not finding that students who are retained report less satisfaction with the quality of, of the education. They're not less happy in school. Okay? The stigma literature would suggest that the kids who get retained are really having a really bad time. Okay? It doesn't look like those kids are, at least according to some of these responses, are having a much worse time than the kids who were promoted just because they passed for the, the, the test by a point. Okay? So if you're a glass half full person on retention, okay, then you should focus on this. But if you, if you are a glass half empty person, you thought it was a really bad thing, the fact that I'm not finding negative effects on some of these student measures should be uh, sure. surprising. Yeah. One of the interesting things there, I, I would share that comment as that, that should be played up. The, the education literature on retention is so negative. Like, um, Very negative. I mean, just yes. makes it out to be the worst possible intervention. Mm -hmm. There are these meta analyses of study after study that doesn't address selection in any way that shows that these kids have bad outcomes. Yes. But part of that does, there's a widely cited sort of survey result where people have been asked to like look back at their lives and report traumatic moments and retention is like the second yeah, most it's so horrible. common it's one. Horrible, yeah. And like so I wonder how we reconcile that pattern with what you're finding. And I mean one of the yeah. because apparently when people look back on their education they see retention as this traumatic event. Even but that seems to be a very yeah. transitory um, and so maybe it's just, it is a clear moment that you remember that is jarring, but it yeah, goes it, away. Maybe, look, the, um, maybe, maybe the only people who remember it are the people for whom it was a jarring event. Yeah, I need, to, so I need to look it, back at exactly how, but the, the critics of retention make heavy use of this fact. And in terms of timing, though, I'll, I'll, I'll go more into the timeline in a second, but your retention, uh, you're going to fail a test in, in, in the spring of, let's say, fourth grade. The retention decision happens by September of that year. I'm not going to get a survey result from you again until April of the next year. So if there's this very short-run trauma, obviously we're not going to, we're not going to pick that up. Yeah. How different are your experimental results from just like your observation, like if you just were to observe? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some summary statistics. I think we can get it off of, off of, off of that. But I mean, okay. I think in general, parents of the kids who are struggling, uh, are not as happy with the quality of their child's education. And um, we can also do, um, you know, you could even do, if you wanted to do like a fixed effects, right, uh, measure. When students' test scores improve 
on a standardized assessment, you know, their parents are happier. Um, I'll think about Marty's point. I mean, I wonder how much the negative kind of literature on retention is somehow tied to like the ways that, or the reasons why students are, reten like, are retained. Mm -hmm. Like here, you're specifically looking at test scores to cut off, which is how you determine where. Yeah, you know, and, I, let, and let me let me let me be clear. So uh, I'll I'll share the second. I'm looking, I'm looking at the test score as to, to help myself get, you know, an instrument for retention. Right. It turns out that of the kids who failed the test, even after New York City puts in a very stringent uh, policy ending social promotion, only 20% of the kids who fail by one point actually get retained. So 80% of the kids who fail are basically, you know, they're put under the microscope, okay, and a series of things will happen, but in the end, 80% of those people move on to the next grade. So we're looking at, a, you know, this is a local average treatment effect estimate on people who are retained because extra scrutiny was put on them because they failed the test. Yeah. And I think that, like, in terms of, like, the negative literature, like, how much of that is also kind of leveraging this sort of test score of discontinuity at some point versus, like, more sort of... It's not. It's not. Yeah. yeah. No, so this literature is not, it's not, uh... Yeah, it's not leveraging something about, like, you know, racial biases of teachers or something that could... There could be lots of other re reasons. Exactly. Things. You're right. So, that's right. So maybe that's another reason to, maybe that's a reason to think about, you know, we don't get the stigma because it's the test. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that, so let me just, you know, uh, let me tell you a second about, it, what, one second about the policy. So um, it started in, with third grade, and then it was kind of phased in. So actually, it's not just a one year where they started. I actually have a, a multiple years where they phase it in different grades. Special ed and ELL students are not included in this policy, okay? So I'm not looking at kids who are, already have learning disabilities or limited English. And then this creates the jump that I was saying before. This is pre-policy over here. Pre-policy was a tiny, <coughs> tiny jump. And then post-policy, you see this much bigger jump in the probability that, that you're retained. Uh, it was controversial, okay? This was not something that Bloomberg did, and I was like, yeah, this is a great idea, you know, you're really smart to do all this extra uh, retention, okay? You know, met by a lot of resistance, and then, you know, uh, heated fight, you know, crying shame the third graders learned who failed the test. I mean, this was not, this was not something where everyone thought ex ante that it would be a good idea, nor something where people thought, oh, and, and these kids are not going to be upset that they failed the test and then maybe have to re re repeat it. So you showed that um, only about 25% of the, of the kids that were below the threshold yeah. were actually retained. Yeah. And presumably some portion... Just below the threshold. Obviously, it gets up to like, when you go way down, then it's up yeah. to like 60%. Yeah. The kids were absolute bottom. But here it's... Yeah. So, in, so what would that graph look like in Chicago or, or some places where people have done this, like where they're, could that reconcile? Oh, you see the size of, compare, compare, we should be comparing the first stages. Yeah, because if it turns out that New York was just particularly... Or to Uruguay, or to any of those places where they could do it, for Florida. We, well, you should know, how big is your first stage? Well, so our overall retention among people below the cutoff in Florida is 48%, so it's higher. The yeah. jump, I think, is 18 percentage points, so I think it's not too... Different, but it, but it, off. it could be that that extra examination that goes on identifies the kids who either would have been most traumatized, you know, or you know, for whom the um, you know there were other things going yes. on, and that I, I you haven't gotten to it yet, but I I think one of the more interesting ideas is that maybe one reason why parents are, are happier is because they finally got the special ed, you know, Yeah, I'll show it to you later. You you get more, you're more likely to be classified as special ed. I, I don't think that explains our results, but I'll, and I'll show you why I don't think that's the case, but it could be part of it. Yeah. Um, okay, so we see this discontinuity. Okay, it was, it was controversial. We see the discontinuity. You know, the assumption is uh, if the student's characteristics, both the observable and the unobservable characteristics, are continuously related to test scores, then any jump in the outcome variable, like parental satisfaction that occurs at this cutoff, we can attribute that to, uh, as a causal effect of having failed the test. Okay, now, interpreting it as, an, as the effect of retention per se requires a little bit more of a leap of faith. I'll show you some evidence why I think 
we can believe that it's the re it's retention and not just failing a test that makes the parents uh, happier. Okay. Uh, like I said, it's a local average treatment. And we should think about these are students who this 20% of students who who are retained because they fail compared to a comparable set of students on this side of the cutoff who, had they failed the test, would have eventually been retained. 80% right? of the kids in this area aren't going to get retained no matter what, whether they fail or not. But for 20% of them, being on this side or that side of the cutoff makes the difference between being retained and not. Yeah. Maybe you're going to get to this, but, um, but to mention another one of Marty's points he's brought up in other of his papers, should we be concerned about reference bias in the sense that, that when we um, are, when we go to another grade, we're going to be... So, yes, so I will get to this at yeah. the end. Maybe parents are happy just because relative to the kids they're going to school with now, they seem to be doing fine. I will try to, I will try to argue that that, that sh doesn't seem to be a, what could explain this, but again, we can, the interpretation is unclear. Right. In the end, I just have a reduced form. Failing the test made your parents happy. So if you really want to be harsh on me, that's all I have. <laughs> uh, failing the test, parents happy. Okay, so just giving you a timeline. So beginning of a, of a, a new school year, September, English and math uh, test administrations happen between February and April, depending on the year. Uh, then the survey gets uh, put out in March and April, but before anyone would have known their students' uh, test score outcomes. Okay, so you fill out the survey here near the end of the year, but before you know what happened on the test. Then the test scores get recorded. Then there's this what is called portfolio review. Just because you failed the test doesn't mean we automatically, you know, uh, fail you for the school year or make you repeat. There's a review. Parents, teachers, principal, whatever, they come in, they talk about the student and they try to make some decisions. Then there's summer school for, for a subset of kids and possible retesting at the end of the summer where they can get another chance to pass. And then there's a final retention determination that happens at the end of the summer, and then we're back to the new school. Okay, so that's kind of the cycle, if you will. Uh, we don't observe portfolio review. I'm getting data, but we haven't got it yet on summer school attendance and the retesting at the end of the summer, but we don't have it now. So for right now, you know, you should just think of the, these three things. I don't have that. I just have one big arrow from test scores to retention. So yeah, that's the end. Thanks. Okay. So surveys go out to all parents, but they only go to students who are six. That says above sixth grade, but it should be sixth grade and above. Okay. So unfortunately, I don't have you know third and fourth and fifth grade uh, surveys. They decided the kids weren't old enough to respond on the surveys. Uh, I think it's probably wrong, but that was the decision. Okay. Uh, they started in the spring of 2006, so this is actually a few years after the retention policy is, is phased in, and the check questions don't change much over time. Um, student response rate is higher for uh, is higher than parents because students do it in school, um, but still it's pretty good, and I'll show you that the parental response rate does not change discontinuously from the children. So we the, the survey has lots of questions. We derive five factors: uh, three for students and two for parents. So students' kind of overall satisfaction, this is the big factor that comes out of the data. Most people are either just overall giving positive or overall giving negative responses. So we'll call that overall satisfaction. Personal safety, it's got a little bit of like, you know, my school is safe, but a bunch of the questions are about like, I feel safe in my school. And uh, their perception of just the school environment. Like, you know, teachers and students get along well at my school. Uh, then we have parents' over, so overall satisfaction. For parents, this is like, this is, this, this is the, the uh, factor that pulls almost all the variance. And then we also have some questions about uh, your, your child's safety. Um, what we'll do is I'm going to rescale all the responses on questions to go from 0 to 100. Uh, and then I'm going to basically, I'm not going to use the factor analysis itself. I'm going to class, use the factor analysis to classify questions as to belonging to one of these factors. And then I'm just going to make the average uh, of everyone's responses across the, the question. So what I mean by rescaling, well imagine, you know, in some questions they might say respond on a, on a, on a scale of one to five, and in other questions it might be respond on a scale of one to four. Right, so how do I, how do I recode those? I basically say, look, if it, let's say for example one to five, then I split up the distance between zero to hundred into these five equidistant uh, blocks, and then I can take averages over questions that might have the same number of, of responses. But essentially, 100 should be like most positive on every possible item, and zero is most negative on every possible item. That's the way to think about it. Yeah. Sure, have you 
look to see if the factor analysis is the same for the retained kids and the non-retained kids? Because I think, given that you're sort of pitching this strategy... Remember, they don't know that they're going to be retained yet. No, uh, okay, so you're doing all with the pre... But, all right, so does the factor oh, structure see. change once Should you... Should I leave them out? Yeah. Just, just to push hard on your yeah. point that you're saying I truly have a measure that's comparable across grades. Or maybe what I should do is I should do the factor analysis By only grade. on the non-retained kids. I don't know what the right thing. I mean, they're, they're so small relative to the rest of the population. They're not going to drive, like, basically, so I guess what I'm remember, I'm not using the factor weights. I'm using the, fa I'm using the factor analysis to tell me which questions to, are, first of all, I'm using the factor analysis to basically negate the idea that a lot of the DOE categories, so the DOE thought, oh, well, we're going to ask questions about communication, or we're going to ask questions about high expectations, we're going to ask questions about blah, blah, blah. Turns out none of that lines up uh, with the factor analysis. It's just like, either you're positive or you're negative, and then there's some stuff on safety that looks like it's somewhat different. Yeah. So I'm using that to motivate, like, which questions I'm going to average together. Yeah, I guess you're, you're pitching the argument that the great advantage you have over, over measuring effects on achievements is that these measures are directly comparable from one, know, one, year, one grade, grade to the next. One grade, and yeah. to really push on that, you might want to actually look at the factor structure of the surveys factor separately structure by, grade. By, grade, by grade, just to show, um, yeah, maybe it's not retention status. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just by grade or just by baseline cutoffs? Uh, I leave it to you to figure that out. Yeah. But it seems like you want to yeah. push on that point, yeah. given the way you set up yeah. the paper. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, in the end, uh, I, you know, could it be that they're answering the questions differently? Of course. What I, I think at a, most, at a more basic level, literally they're asking them the same question. And it's not like a fifth grade parent has um, an advantage or a disadvantage on answering that question relative to a fifth grade student would have an advantage in answering fifth grade math questions relative to a fourth grade student. Uh, but you're right. We should we should do it by grade to make sure that that's true. that it's okay for us to be pulling because we are because we're pulling. Uh, okay, giving you an, uh, an example. You know how to, how satisfied are you with the findings about your child's school, the quality of your teachers, how well your child's school communicates with you, obviously you develop the association of the education your child is giving you. So this is, you know there's pretty broad based stuff, and it all most for the, for the parents pretty much lines up on. on I'm not going to go more into the surveys given the time. I'll give you some basic descriptive statistics. Uh, this is the full sample. Above, everything's normal. The test scores are normalized to be mean zero, standard deviation one at the population level. But remember, we exclude special ed and ELL. So the sample average is above zero. Obviously, people who are close to the cutoff, this is our, my regression disciplinary sample, which is within, I think it's within 10 uh, questions of the cutoff, we cut it we, uh, uh, each way. Um, this, that, you know, they're they're obviously low scoring, okay. And the people below the cutoff are obviously more low scoring than those above. But here is much more instructive, okay. This is of the kids who fail, those who are actually retained still have lower torts test scores than the ones who are promoted. But I can't just compare retained versus promoted, even conditional having the exact same test score, because. There is a reason why one kid gets retained and one kid gets promoted, and it has to do with all this other stuff about those kids that I can't observe that happens during the portfolio review, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? These, you know, ret retained kids are negatively selected on a bunch uh, on a bunch of dimensions. Um, free lunch, I'll just show you, look, almost everyone in, in New York City is 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 coming from a, a household uh, you know, receiving free or free price lunch. But even at the level of poverty, we see you know slight differences, right? Ninety-four percent free or reduced price lunch versus 96%, among all the kids who failed, the kids who are retained are more likely to live in families with, uh, in, okay, so uh, not, not randomly. Uh, this is the, this is the um, similar statistics for the survey. This goes to a little bit what, you, what was being asked uh, before, right? The uh, parent is satisfied full survey average is 74 on my scale from zero to 100. Uh, low scoring kids worse. Among those who failed, it's worse, and it's worse among those whose kids, whose kids were retained. But remember, this is before they know their kids are going to get retained. Okay? But your kid just bombed the test, right? Uh, so they're clearly not doing so well in school, right? They're not doing so well in school. Um, so let's just, I'll just run quickly through the, the re regression discontinuity design assumptions, but we want to check for continuity. If all the observables... And, uh, and, and, and sample attrition, other stuff, all that's uh, continuous through that cutoff score, then we hope that the unobservables that we can't see are also continuous. Okay, so 
the density of scores is very continuous, so there's no manipulation of whether you're above or below the cutoff. That's not surprising in this case because these tests are all centrally scored by the State Department of Education by outside folks. Yeah, very nice. Well, you know, it's a big sample, so it should work. Uh, this is uh, free and reduced price lunch. This is uh, survey responses. We do have a bunch more checks in the paper, but I'm just showing you a few. And this is like the response rates. This is for the parent survey. There's no, obviously, look, if your kid's higher scoring, you're more likely to respond to the survey. Okay? Kids, who's, uh, kids who do really, really bad on the test, their parents are less likely to respond. But what's important is there's no jump in response rate at the discount. Is the, is the attrition conditional on being around in that subsequent year, or is it? So I, I was just wondering. Oh, like, yeah, 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 I've done are you in the school system as well. That, that, that's also continuous through the special. There's no differential leaving of the of, of New York City. Um, okay, so now we can, we, we can be a little bit more confident that we're going to get causal effects. I'll show you the first, the, we'll do the first stage, and then I'll show you two stage least squares uh, results. So you, we can sort of define an index, which is the minimum of your ELA, English language arts, or math score relative to the cutoff, because failing either one of these things gets you uh, under the microscope. We have a dummy variable for whether you failed, and then we're going to estimate this sort of linear uh, first stage. We've got, um, did you fail? And we're going to interact, did you fail with, are you in a grade and year where the more stringent policy was in effect? Because we can clearly see from that graph earlier that it matters a lot more if you failed when the, when the policy was more strict. I'm going to have a flexible function for this for the continuous index score, we'll put in some fixed effects for grade, year, et cetera. Um, I said all of that, so go on. So this is the first stage. So even pre-policy, there was a small jump at the cutoff. We saw that in the graph before at about three percentage points. But then post-policy, we're getting a much bigger jump, 20%. Um, so then in the second stage, we're going to estimate uh, impact on some outcome. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by lag in a second. We have that same flexible control for the index score, and then we have our uh, instrumented uh, change in, in your actual retention uh, outcome. What I'll call lag here, we can be think about it. Lag zero is literally current year. So when I estimate an impact on outcomes in your current year, this is like our placebo test. Okay? It would be bad if in the year that we don't know you're going to be retained yet, your parents were already much more satisfied uh, when we crossed the threshold from passing uh, to failing, okay? So uh, lag zero is current year, and then I'm going to look at lag you know, one, two, three. I'm going to pool future together for power, and then I'll show it to you broken out. Um, so this sigma coefficient here is going to give us the causal effect of retention under the, under the assumption that the only channel through which failing the test impacts your outcomes y is through Okay, that's an assumption, right? That's an assumption. We'll, I'll come back to why I think that's an okay assumption, but <coughs> I said that. That's a placebo. Lag zero is a placebo test. We pool. Okay, just to understand how we structure the data, we're going to stack the data. So you can have a test year test grade. This student failed because their index was minus three. They got retained. Then I'm going to look at surveys. Survey's going to happen in 2007, 8, 9, and 10. Survey grade is five. Then five again. Then six and seven. Okay, we're going to cluster all the standards by student because I'm going to see this student in the data multiple times. Um, so I'll start by look, showing you some non-survey outcomes. So it's, I think I want to just compare this to some other, uh, some other uh, estimates, and then, um, and then I'll jump into the survey outcomes. So placebo effect on test scores. Uh, I kind of already showed this again. You know, test scores are, are continuous in, the, in their distance to the cutoff. That's not surprising. Future effects on test scores, though, clear discontinuity. Okay, I don't know if it's so clear from this graph, but remember, this is reduced form. This isn't two states least squared. I'm literally showing you test score in years, you know, t plus one, t plus two, plus two, three, against your minimal distance from the cutoff. So remember, only 20% of the kids, as you cross the threshold, even in the policy years, are retained. So these jumps, even though they don't look very big, the two states least squared estimate is going to blow that up a lot. Okay, uh, this is math, this is an ELA. So, like I said before, after you're retained, you score higher than your grade mates, okay? Or relatively higher relative to your grade mates than the, than the kids who got uh, promoted, okay? So 
Um, those are standard deviation units, right? And yeah, standard deviation units. And so we should be extending them so that they hit the line and then looking at the vertical. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. these are same grade comparisons? Same grade. I'm doing only same grade comparisons. Okay, you could do same grade or you could do, no, no, no. These are same year comparisons. Same year comparisons, not same grade comparisons. Okay, sorry, make them through. I'm comparing, so, Marty and I are in fourth grade. He passes by a point. I fail by a point. Okay, I take fourth grade again. He takes fifth grade. I'm asking, how's your standardized test score in fifth grade? How's your standardized test score in fourth grade relative to one another? I'm not going to ask, wait a year and see how Jonah does in fifth grade and compare that to Marty's test score in fifth grade from the prior year. Okay? You can imagine doing same age, or these are same age comparisons, not same grade comparisons. Both of those are going to have trade offs. Uh, and because I'm not focusing on the academic outcomes, I'm just going to show you same, same, uh, same age, not same grade. So you can describe this like difference in percentile ranks. You yeah, you can describe this. How, how, how do I rank relative to the kids in your city? That's another way to look at it. All right, and then absences, suspensions, and special ed. So uh, good thing nothing happening in the placebo, and nothing really going on for absences and suspensions. You know, we get a little bit, but it's not um, significant. But we do get something for special ed. So we do see an uptick of about... Uh, this is two states with square estimates now. 5.6 percentage point increase in your probability of being classified as special ed. From a baseline of zero, remember, because none of these kids were classified in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade when they were being when they were taking these tests. Okay, so that that that's significant. We'll come back to whether we think that could be driving anything on the survey. Okay, um, this is placebo, so obviously they're not in different grades when they're taking the test in the same grade. That's good, but that doesn't that's close to zero. And then obviously this is going to be negative one in year two, in, in, sorry, in the, in the following year because one could get retained and one didn't. But what's interesting here is the fade out. And I think in Florida it fades out a, a, a bit quicker than this. So the way to interpret this is three years out, 10% of the kids who just passed the test have subsequently been retained, okay, three years later. So we should, you, you could see some attenuation of other uh, outcomes because you know, 10% of the untreated kids eventually got treated by your T plus 3. I think in Florida it might be like 70% three years out. Uh, uh, about, yeah, it's about that. No, that's right. I don't know. But, but I think we, I, 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 I don't know for sure what the number is for, for a few years later, because we, but we've got that new data. I think it fades out to something like 0. 0.6 if I look six years, six years away. Yeah? When kids get retained, is it always they go back a whole grade or they advance, or do they ever get retained just in a single subject? That's a great question. We don't have to retain them entirely. If you just failed math and you're a great English student, why am I making you do fourth grade English again? That's, but that is the way they, they do it in these grades. In high school, you know, what does it mean to have grade retention is a bigger question. I haven't dug into the high school data that we got, the course data, it would be interesting to think about what, what does grade classification mean there. They do have grade retention. Literally, you have some people doing grade nine again, but are they taking all, I, have, I don't know the answers, but like, are they taking all the same classes again? That would be kind of stupid. Uh, are they just taking over like the math class that they failed, but because they never passed ninth grade math, we can't say that they're in 10th grade yet. Uh, I, need to, I need to dig in more. But you're right. Here, in elementary school, literally, we make you repeat third grade. Now, should I, uh, should, I, should I be so sure of that? Probably not. I should probably check to see if in some of the uh, later grades for that in middle school, uh, do we see any instances where someone could be repeating sixth grade English but not math or vice versa? We, can, I mean, we should check. Um, Okay, so just like ELA and math, the year after you're retained, you move up, you know, uh, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the standard deviation relative to these, you know, young kids who are not repeating the grade again, okay? But, you know, that, that fades out uh, pretty quickly, but that's not, not, not very differently from the kind of fade out you see in, in Florida, okay? I'm still doing better relative to my new classmates than I would have had they promoted me, but, the, you know, you're not seeing such huge impacts after uh, three years. Okay. Um, parent is satisfied, okay? Uh, and I should go... Oh, good. Yeah, yeah good. We find large significant reasons parents set. This is about a third of a standard deviation. That's important. So um, this is in that zero to 100 scale. So placebo effect is zero. That's good because uh, there shouldn't be an effect we haven't... We don't know who's retained yet. 
And then if I pool the first three, the first three years, I get about 5.4 on that 0 to 100 scale, but that's about a, almost a third of a standard deviation of parental satisfaction. Okay, that's a really big uh, effect. And then this is, um, does parent consider the school safe? We don't really find anything. Student satisfaction, we don't really get anything. Uh, but student feels safe, we get a pretty big uh, effect in, in, in the future. And student says that this has likes environment. I should say, I don't know likes, but what they say about the environment in the school, that goes up, but it's not statistically significant. Tom. Um, I wonder whether the effects on students feeling safe. I'm a big kid now. I know. I yeah. wonder if that's different for boys versus girls. Uh, you know, so like, yeah, I should have the answer. If, but, I'm, uh, if I'm all of a sudden I'm in the biggest kid in class. Yeah. Might be so I don't think it's the big hidden class, and I'll get back to that. I don't know offhand though if we get if we split the sample by boys and girls, is it driven just by just by boys? I should know that, but I don't. Um, okay, now I'm going to break it out by year one, year two, year three, and we see dynamics are slightly different. Okay, so for parents, okay, the parent satisfaction measure doesn't seem to rise immediately, but then by year two and three it does. Okay, now I, you know the standard errors are big here. Right? So I'm not sure I could, you know, I can't really reject anything, okay? But if you just wanted to use the point estimates to spot a trend, you'd say maybe there's something to do with that first year of retention. Maybe, you, you know, there's more problems, but eventually when I look at years two and three, um, parents are, are, are more satisfied, okay? Students, the safety comes immediately and if anything seems to fade out. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit more about the late assumptions around this? Sure. And maybe how how might the, the people, the background characteristics of the of the students who of, of the students who fail the test by one point that don't repeat the grade compared to the background characteristics of the students who fail the test by one point but do repeat the grade. Is there a lot of heterogeneity in some sort of socioeconomic or other types of? Well, that's what I was showing you in the in the in the summaries. I think the summary statistics before were getting a little bit of that question, showing that um, even among the set of folks who fail, the 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 kids who are retained look worse on observables than the kids who are who, who pass. But of course, the problem with that comparison is you saw the gradient. Remember, I, I do that graph, and even though there was a jump at 20% of the cutoff. The retention rate for the kids who are way below the cutoff is like 60%. So another reason why, among the set of all failing students, the ones that are retained will look worse is because I'm wait retention is much more uh, common among the kids who fail by 10 questions than the ones who fail by one question. Um, if I, you want me more to like sort of condition on on single um, uh, on individual scores. I only have 15 minutes, so I probably won't be able to show it. We do some stuff to try to get away from the late. We have this this, this paper by uh, Mika Rokanen and Josh Angers that just want to get away paper that tries to do reweighting to see what the lates could be away from the cutoff, and we do that. But I'm, and if anything, actually, we find evidence that the late would be uh, greater among the higher scoring students than it is among the lower scoring students, which surprised me. But I'm not going to have time to probably get into that. I'll show you, how to show it to you later if you want. Yeah. Just a quick question. Do you have their birthday? Like how far, like are, if you're older? Yeah, I do. I will, I will show you. So let, me, let, me, let me punch on that. I'll show you some birthday stuff in, uh, in a second. Uh, just um, just to, to, to clarify, you know, this could be driven by the years where they were only retaining, they're going from like 0 to 3% if you failed versus the years and grades where it went from like 0 to 20%. Remember, there's the, pre there's the policy and the non-policy years. What do we do here is we're just breaking it out by policy versus uh, non-policy. So in the, in the pooled analysis, my first stage has an interaction between failed and a policy year. But I'm just using those as two instruments for retention and restraining the, and constraining the effective retention, the retention coefficient of the second stage to be the same. Here I'm letting that retention coefficient be different for policy graded in years versus non-policy graded in years. And what you can see is that all the power is in the policy years, because that's where all the variation is being driven from. But post-policy, okay, future outcomes, that's what's driving the effects. The future outcomes for pre-policy retention actually get negative point estimates, but the standard errors are huge, because why? The jump in retention probability for crossing the threshold is, you know, a couple of percentage points. There's very little power there, okay? But if you were worried, if you were, if you were convinced that the Bloomberg policy was wrong-headed, and that that 
said those retained students were not benefiting. But in the earlier regime, when they were making decisions and it was only going from zero to three percent, maybe those are the kids that were driving all the positive effects because those were good retention decisions. That does not line up with these results, right? The positive effects for finding for parents and students uh, were driven by the by the by the post policy retention uh, variation. That's of course where all the power is, but um, that's the fragment. Okay, um, so. Let me, let me talk about mechanisms. This has come up in a bunch of different uh, questions. So many of these uh, hypotheses for what's driving the results are kind of fundamentally untestable. We try to think of some common explanations and then try to see if we could, if, if those uh, hold a lot of water. Okay, so students failing tests are given e even greater attention regardless of whether they're retained or not. So you failed the test. Next year, everyone knows you failed the test. The teacher works hard with you. And your, and your parents are more satisfied, and it doesn't matter whether you were retained or not. Remember, at the end of the day, as in where all I have is you failed the test, your parents are happy. Okay? So what we do here is, this is, and this is not kosher, this is not causal, okay, but what I'm going to do here is, on the right-hand side, you have all the kids who passed, okay? This is, uh, teach, this is parental satisfaction, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and on the left side, in the dark circles, I'm plotting the responses of the parents whose kids failed but did not get retained. And in the triangles, I'm plotting the responses of the parents of kids who failed and did get retained. Now, I don't know on this side of the graph who would have been retained had they failed. So there's no real comparison you can make across these two things. But I find it comforting that the responses of parents whose kids failed but were promoted look basically like a continuation of the line for the kids who just barely passed. Whereas distinctly higher is the satisfaction level of the parents whose kids were actually retained. That is not proof, but at least it would be much worse if those two things were flipped, right? If all of the positive, if the, if the, if the parents who seem to be unusually happy relative to the trend were the ones whose kids who failed, but they let them go on anyway. Okay? So, yeah. So, the, do you have data like on the, um, the rating or the evaluation score of the teachers they were assigned to? Like, like so, if I'm Only the starting in 2012 when they start doing the yeah. formal like, evaluation. But for those or, or even like the value added score. So we could construct a value added yeah. score. Yeah. yeah. So like if if I've got a retained kid Am I getting a better teacher? Yeah. 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 And we could do and we could let it, at the very least I could say am I getting a rookie or am I getting some yeah. other Right. It could be that a principal saying teacher character is not yeah. rookie. We should think about uh, our teacher characters is changing. Discontinuously across the cutoff, we should do that. Um, at least I can do experience and some other and some other things. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is that the effects of failing the test. It's hard to it's hard for me to imagine that the effects of failing the test, you know, persist for three years, right? Um, it just seems like the effects of retention. I can imagine those having long-lasting impacts. The effects of having failed the test three years ago on my kids' satisfaction today, given that they were promoted anyway, it's harder to it's hard to imagine that 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 change. Okay, uh, retained students maybe they feel safer because they're older, okay, relative to their to their grade mates. So what we do here is, I know the date of birth, so I can run a regression of how sa how how um, safe do you feel on how old you are within grade, right? So I just say if you're the oldest kid in the grade versus like the youngest kid in the grade, we find that you are 0.75 points sa uh, safer. You feel 0.75 points safer. Remember on a scale of 0 to 100. But remember, the first year effect that I showed you, because it faded out a little bit by the end, was 11 points. 11. <laughs> OK? So maybe you know, being bigger is part of it, but uh, I, you know, it's unclear that, that, you know, that that's right. Um, Retain students have better relative academic performance. So again, I'll I'll run a regression of um, parent satisfaction on standardized uh, test scores. But if we uh, if we um, 
we get, well, we get one point of satisfaction for a full standard deviation of test scores in a cross-sectional regression. That's what that means. And th that can be biased for all sorts of reasons, but okay, it's the cross-sectional regression. Parents whose kids score one standard deviation higher, they are more satisfied by one point. Okay? The initial increase in scores was like 0.6 or 0.7 points. That shouldn't explain our five or six point percentage increase in, in parental satisfaction. Okay? And the last is special ed could be doing it. We see that some kids are getting, they're getting more likely to be classified as special ed. Um, you know, it's hard to know what the effect of special ed is. We can drop all the special ed kids uh, from, from, the, from the data set who are classified ex post, and that doesn't change the results uh, at all. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's the perfect fix for this possible hypothesis, but it's, it's an easy one. Uh, and it would be bad if you dropped them out and, and the results went away. Um, so I don't, these could all play a role. All these explanations could play a role, but no single one of these things I think drives the whole, the, the whole, uh, and given the time, I'm going to uh, skip my uh, want to get away econometric uh, exercise and just, uh, and, and, and wrap it up. Uh, oh, you have a question, sir. Uh, one question just on the student safety. Like, yeah. do you see in which part of the distribution of, like, do people feel safe? this comes from? Like, is it people that were extremely unhappy and now go to normal, or is it something, is it a shift yeah. in the distribution of? Yeah, so we, um, on, not, on any of these outcomes, we've only looked at the mean, essentially. So we should think about, thinking about, who are we moving? I don't have an answer for you, but we should be. We we we, sh we certainly can look at different parts of the distribution. I can think about, you know, uh, I mean, remember the well, no, we have the average across a lot of questions. So I can I could do things like, are you giving a response, you know, greater than point two, greater than twenty five, greater than fifty, greater than seventy five, and just see w what on what dimension of satisfaction or safety feelings are we really getting on the action? It could tell you something about where it's coming from. Right? Yes, right. It's yes, yeah, yeah. They, 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 we would we'd be, it'd be odd if all the action was starting on kids who feel really safe, super, super safe. We wanted to see it kind of the kids who felt like they weren't safe are now feeling more moderately safe. Yes. Um, kind of related to the class question, do you have any idea what the likelihood is that students end up retaking a grade with the same teacher they had? I don't off the top of my head. Um, do you think that that could be, that could be driving I'm just curious. Yeah, although they didn't, that, that relationship didn't work out so great the year before. Right. So <laughs> it's not because that would be a good thing. It's almost never happens in Florida, but it was okay. a policy that they would not allow it. Ah, uh, I see, which makes so sense because obviously you just had a, you had a not so great outcome. Maybe we should try something different mm -hmm. this year. But we, sh we have, I haven't linked teacher data with this data set. We could. Uh, yeah. Is there a question in the survey around how students perceive like their teacher's engagement with them at all? My teacher is my quality. They don't ask direct questions about the teacher. Why? Because this survey is part of the school accountability system, which had to be kind of agreed upon, at least implicitly, with the union. So they do ask parents, how satisfied are you with the quality of your child's teacher this year? So actually, some I've been playing around with maybe we should start looking at this as kind of another a measure of teacher quality and doing something with that. I haven't done it yet. But there's very little that's kind of, that's just rating your teacher. Um, it's asking a lot more about the school overall. And for, for the kids who are in sixth through middle school and up, it's, they're going to have many teachers. And so it's a plural. It's how the quality of your child's teachers is here. Yeah. Just, just, is there some way that controlling for like transitions from elementary to middle school, like in this grade span, like if you're being retained? Yeah, you're yeah. So we try to deal with that with a bunch of these fixed effects. So, so, so you're right. When you go to middle school, things could get worse. And obviously the next year, I'm going to go to middle school before you. So we try to use in the general decline in responses from fifth grade to sixth grade for tra middle school transitions. Uh, and we even, I think in a robust check, have like a, a, a control for like, I just made the transition. Now that's just generally identified off of cross, you know, sort of a, um, cross-sectional variation, but it doesn't seem to, that's not driving our results, yeah. So what, I think one of the rationales that schools have to do these things is not about the, the kids in question, it's about their who their classmates would have been next year. So they, they do this because, partially because 
if they fear that these kids would have held back like their fourth grade classmates next year, say if this mm -hmm. is the end of third grade. So yes. So maybe even if that spill like pure effect yeah. spillovers, right? But like you could test that because um, because they didn't do this in every grade. Like so you could yeah. say like was there did you see that's right. Two that's right. The way they phase this in for that initial phasing year, you're going to have too many low achieving kids in third grade than fourth grade. Yeah. Because right. fourth grade didn't have uh, this harsh retention in third grade. Right. So, what happened to the achievement gains in third and fourth grade yeah. in that? And then, same thing with the other years when the policy came into effect. That sounds like almost like, like another paper. No? Yeah. yeah. But, but yes, but yes. We, have, we can identify that. We can identify that. You can do that too, right? But you guys Not didn't. with them across grade. Oh, because it was blank. It was just third grade. Yeah. It's just third grade. Four. Okay. Um, positive effects on parental satisfaction, and student safety. Doesn't appear to be some mechanical effect of being older or scoring relatively higher on test or classification. That's true, but all these things kind of, you know, they may have played some, some, some role. Um, I think a big question that we're left with here, though, is do we care? Do we care that parents are happier? Um, you know, you know, I, I can't answer that, that question. But I, I will say, look, we let parents and students make a lot of decisions, right? Particularly for things like school choice, dropout decisions. Like, we let them choose whether or not they should go to this school or that school or whether they should be in school at all. So we should care about whether they're getting a good quality, uh, a high quality education, I think, uh, if we're going to make, let them make those decisions. Um, but I can't obviously, you know, know whether parental satisfaction is directly related to higher human capital you know, stimulation. One second. And what, I, what we're going with this is we're going to add more years of, of data, we'll have more precise results, longer follow-up, and hopefully high school credits and completion. Now, as, as Martin knows, even the high school outcomes are hard, right, because, you know, someone, they're going to get there first. So I've got to figure out, you know, you've got to give a sufficient amount of time for the retained kids to make it through and graduate high school. Um, and I don't think we have that many cohorts at this point that, that will do that, but we're going we're, we're to try to incorporate that. Question that? I was just, I mean, to your second set of bullets up there, I was wondering if you have any measures of actual parental engagement, like, did they attend a parent-teacher conference or something that you can yeah. kind of tie the survey data to some sort of action that, you know, we would, we would think is um, objectively, you know, a good thing? Yeah. I, do, I mean, I don't is the short answer. I'm trying to think it, off the top of my head if there's some other, if there's, if there's a, a place in, like, in the administrative data that kind of thing would be tracked. Uh, There's a little bit of data I've heard on PTA stuff, but that's not going to pick up very many, many parents. I know that's going to be a pretty extreme form of participation. So, but it would be great, the right, to see, you know, um, parental engagement. So, what, what are your reliabilities for these measures? I'm just trying to um, disattenuate your standard deviations here. Like, it, uh, maybe the effects are bigger just because they're noisy. Ah, from from year to like what's the what's the straight alpha is straight year to year. Oh, 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 for like overall satisfaction, it's okay. going to be very, very high because almost all the questions are going on overall satisfaction. Oh, right. and there are a lot of them. A lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The survey is is like uh, I want to say it's around twenty items long. Yeah. 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 So so We're safety is going to be worse because safety is going to be based on a smaller set of items, but the overall satisfaction ones are. They're going to have a pretty high reliability. Okay, so standard deviation units are pretty interpretable. It's like true score standard deviation units. Yeah, yeah I should think, I should think so. Yeah, yeah. This is a follow-up to the question about delayed sort of the compliers, non-compliers. Yeah. Not. Did you look at race? I didn't see race on the table. Just out of curiosity. Nope. Uh, you, I'm, I'm sure if I it, sorry it, it, if it's not if it's not on the paper we should add it. I'm sure you're going to see greater fractions of minority students every time you go to a, a worse selected. Uh, sample. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, you know, I think uh, roughly 80% of the kids in New York are black or Hispanic. So, you know, I mean, 
Oh, it's like free lunch. Like we're not going to get a lot of heterogeneity on, on, on race. Yeah, I'm going to have a lot of heterogeneity on, on, soci on SCS. Okay. All right. So um, I just wanted to thank Jonah for, for joining us today. Um, and there's a reception uh, afterwards. So great. Thank you.